Nelda R. from Midland, Texas. And you want to hear my story after that? <laughs> Have you ever began to wake up some morning, maybe it's in our past lives, and think, my God, what am I doing here? Uh, how did I get here? Well, I think I remember that feeling right now, and I don't think I am that person that uh, Deanne described. Uh, you know, I've been a substitute a lot, and I always went out in substitutes. I just love being a substitute. Some of my greatest gifts has been come as, the, as uh, an opportunity to serve. I would like to thank the committee, and especially Joe Ben. And how can you refuse those blue eyes <laughs> when Joe Ben comes up and he says, uh, we really do need help, and the word is need, and we really would like to ask you to help us in this time of need. And you know, those blue eyes, and I just said, well, what can I do? <laughs> it really wasn't that simple, but that's made a good story. Uh, I am Nelda Razier, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm sober today, and I have been since September the 22nd of 72, and that was yesterday. And I'm... <laughs> And I'm sober today, and I have been, and I am so very, very grateful for my sobriety. Uh, another thought I had as I was sitting there thinking, can I imagine myself getting in front of my mom and dad, and who I just adored, particularly my dad, I just worshipped him and had him on a pedestal, would I get up or would I come to his house and I would tell him for an hour where I'd been and what I'd been doing? <laughs> That's kind of how I feel tonight because you're family. I came to you first in September of 1971. I had had uh, five months of dry time. It was sort of a pink cloud time. It was just wonderful. And Joe Clare was instrumental uh, getting me here, and as he was so many of the people in the 710 group. And I came in, and you know, I had too much makeup on, and I was overdressed, and my hair was this tall. And uh, we had old, old dorms. Our dorms are the Hilton today compared compared to what we came, where I came, when we came in. And I had a top bunk, and there was a, a raw light bulb right above it, and there was a, a bathroom right, just right here, and it only had a shower curtain on it. And there was a shower and a commode and a lavatory, and we had about 15 women in there. And I thought, oh my goodness. And, you know, <laughs> and I thought a few other things, because you know, by that time, <laughs> Because that time, by that time, I had become somebody, you know. I had worked real, real hard to have arrived. Uh, and, uh, and I was sitting on top of that bed, because that's the only place you could get that was clean, because I had it all made up and nice, you know. And I thought, my God, how did I get here? What is happening to me? And I had a miracle that weekend. I had a miracle. Uh, I felt and I didn't know what it was. I know today I felt a room full of love, acceptance. I felt healing that I didn't even know that was about. I didn't know how sick I was. I didn't know every area of my body was in bankruptcy. And that was the beginning of Brownwood for me. And since 1971, I drank again in September 1972, but for one night. But that was my beginning and I have missed one Brownwood in all those many years. And that's how important this is to me. Uh, I like to start out with one story, is what does an alcoholic look like? What does a sober woman of, alcoholism, uh, of Alcoholics Anonymous look like? You know, I'm not a very good judge, and my first judge was, I went, to a, I went to a lot of conferences when I got sober, and I went to the International Women's Conference in Oklahoma City, and they were just the most beautiful ladies there. They were. That was in the 70s, and they dressed to the hilt, and uh, they were like six ladies sitting on a panel, and all of them talked, and this one little lady got up, and she wasn't dressed like the other ladies. 
she had a little house dress that sort of snapped, you know, and she had her hair and it was just very gray, and it was very natural and it was shined beautifully and it was combed, it was parted and it was just like so many of the ladies that you see in the, that I had seen in the nursing homes and had on uh, t white tennis shoes and little anklets and that was for anklets and tennis shoes were popular. And then she gets up behind the podium and I thought, oh my goodness. And she gets up behind the podium and she says, she'd been sober 35 years and she says, I'm here because of sin and gin and men. <laughs> identified <laughs> identified and I didn't know all about it I didn't know all about that part of sin and gin in me then but I come to find out about it um, the thing that I would like to share about first and tell you about why I think this might be a little bit difficult for me is I was 33 years old when I got in the program and I certainly have been sober longer than I've been drunk thank God and you know I have not told my story my experience in a long long time because I have been living uh, in, in the amends, in the sobriety, in the now time, and living a wonderful, wonderful life of sobriety, and I'm so grateful for that. But for identity, I do need to share a little bit about my experiences. Um, my first drunk, my first drink, was about age 13, and you know, uh, our parents were gone, which were very rarely f free of them when I was growing up, and um, I was with the group, and we drank, and you know, uh, God, I got all the feelings that I had been searching for and needing all my life. I was born and my first thought was I, was a, I didn't fit in. I was a very uh, ugly duckling. I had a, an abandoned issue with my mother. I idolized my daddy and uh, I didn't like living on that farm with, you know, like the uh, picking cotton and um, chopping cotton and wearing feed sack dresses and being poor. And I didn't even know any different life, but I knew I didn't like that. And I've always wanted more and more and more. And you know, I'm the only misfit in my family. And so uh, I was there alone floundering and I would go to my mother and I would say, I'd tell her how I felt about things and she'd just shake her head. I'd go to my teachers and tell them how I felt about things. They'd just shake their head. No one ever said the words to me as I understand until I came in the first night in Alcoholics <laughs> Anonymous and one woman said to me who later became my sponsor, is, oh, honey, I understand. And she said it with such meaning that I knew exactly that she knew what I was talking about. So that's the way I got my first drink. I was ready. I was ready for something to make me feel different. And that night, until I was 22 years old, I, I felt I used alcohol. It was on a very limited basis because we were so poor. But I would drink when we'd go on a date, to go dancing or whatnot. And I love to do all those things. And um, I worked real hard to get off that farm, worked real hard to get to the city. You know, I wanted to be somebody. I read books how to set a table. I read books on love. And I don't mean the boy-girl kind of love. I mean about the love that you hear in church that I never quite connected with, the love that we talk about today that I had never, ever connected with. I was started reading books about that. I read books about thank you notes. I read books about setting table, you know, how to dress because I was so hungry to be different. And I know today that I, wanted to, I needed to be so different on the inside. I was gangrene of the soul. And it was way, way far back before I ever took that first drink. But each drink I, t each drink I take, I became more gangrenous, you know, and I can just feel that and I can see that today. And I lived that way until I was 33 years old. Uh, I married when I was 22 to a man that had three children and I just idolized those kids because I couldn't have children. And uh, you know, I, I had a friend say to me before we married, she says, are you sure you're marrying him for him or for those kids? And you know, I said, oh, it's, you know, it's him, I really love him. Well, I cried for 12 years, I was married to that man for 12 years and I don't think that's the way marriage goes. I, I was, uh, had quit drinking when I was about 17 with the exception of just when I went to a party and I would have very limited amount because I'd already started limiting and I'd have just less than a teaspoon in a Coke. But that's how it affected me. And when I married, I was going to church and I didn't, um, we didn't go out. We, we were raising children and I was going to PTA and I just loved doing all those things. I loved being that mother role. 
Uh, I loved having a home. I loved making a home. I loved the respectability that I thought all that brought to me. I was going to church and I was sitting there dead, just dead. And it got to the point in order to survive that haven that I so badly wanted, I would take a drink and then I'd take another drink in the evenings in order just to survive. And it got to the point with alcohol and also prescription drugs because along with that drinking came, you know, I got nervous and I couldn't sleep and they tried anti all that stuff, you know. So I was fully addicted to prescription drugs when I got here, more so than I was alcohol. And it just enhanced it. I passed over the line of alcoholism. When I was 26 years old, standing in front of my beautiful house in my kitchen and looking out the window, and it was in April, and that, I never shall forget this, it was as though I took that drink, and I'd already limited myself to two drinks a long time before that. And I took that drink, and I had gotten down from drinking good stuff to bad stuff. And that bad stuff, I could hardly swallow it. And I had to make a decision right at that moment. Am I going to drink this, or am I not? And I drank that, and then I drank the bottle. I was 26 years old. And my alcoholism started there. And from that day on until I was 33 and I got to this program. You know, I had a, a full-time job that was very responsible that I went to. I had a life that appeared to be responsible. I had a, a place in the community that appeared to be responsible, and I was dead inside. And it got to the point that suicide looked good. And I attempted suicide on a couple of different occasions. And when the second time I did, or attempted to do that, and I came to sober and alive, or dry and alive. You're a failure in every area of your life when you can't even kill yourself. Because the pain of life was so great that I thought I can't handle this any longer. The way I found Alcoholics Anonymous is through Al-Anons, and, and I love Al-Anons. But you know, they wouldn't let me stop off on Al-Anon. I had to go directly to the other side <laughs> uh, I was doing a social. I did a, a bridesmaid's luncheon for the little girls that worked for me. And uh, that was on a Saturday noon on April the 3rd. And I couldn't wait until the caterer came and picked up all those dishes and things because I had to be somewhere doing something. And I was sort of limiting myself not to drink to 5 o'clock. And so I, I pile all that stuff in the trunk of my car and I drive over to the caterer's. And she wasn't there, but the lady in her kitchen was. And let me describe the lady in her kitchen. The lady in her kitchen was, had a college degree that could not get a job in Midland, Texas. She had five kids. She drove a, a blue convertible uh, Mercury, uh, that fancy Mercury, that, you know, a huge, long convertible. She had five kids. Her husband's in the uh, oil business, drunk for a number of years. She had a home in one of the most prestigious parts of Midland. And she was selling pieces of her furniture and antiques out of her home to feed her five children. And she was working for this caterer because she was taking the, like the turkey, of a, the, the carcass of a turkey that was left from the parties and she was making wonderful food to feed her children. She was going to, uh, on Thanksgiving, she was going and picking up baskets of food because the disease of alcoholism for her children. And here I am, a country girl that can barely, you know, get in out of the rain, and I had a wonderful home. I had a pretty home, I had a job, I had a, you know, I was surviving. And she talked with a lightness, and she talked with a God that was just out of this world, and she was a brand new al -Anon. And she started talking to me about her, and then my dad was alcoholic, and then she thought maybe that I might need an, an Al-Anon problem. I have an Al-Anon problem. And after we talked, and she and a group of her Al-Anon friends, all new in the program, started picking me up for lunch from the office. And we'd lunch. And they did such a good job on me. On April the 29th, I had all I could stand of me. I had all I could stand, and I called. And I said, I'm ready. I'm ready for help. And he said, oh, but we can't help you but we'll give you two ladies 
and they gave me the name of two ladies. And one of the ladies couldn't come the night she was doing a fifth step. And the second one came and brought her husband. Because by that time, it was a little, it got a little violent from time to time in my household, particularly if I was drinking. And so she and her husband came, and, and he was the Al Anon, the husband was the Al Anon. And she came in, I'd never met her before, and she came the night I called her. And I was drunk on wine. And she came, and I was sober. I, was, I, could, I remember everything. I remember how she looked. I remember her expression. And she was a tiny little lady. And she came in, and I told her my tale of woe, and I told her that I needed her to help me tell him that I was not OK. And we had a, a, a nice talk, and I made a commitment that night. And I said to this man that I'd been married to 12 years, and I had never, ever done this before, as I am going to do something. I am going to those meetings. My daddy was a drunk, and I knew about his kind of drunk. I didn't know about my kind. His was a staggering staying drunk for two years. And you know, I was still drinking out of reasonably pretty glasses and had some reasonable looks about me and some reasonable dignity about me. And my daddy had lost that a long time ago. I used to care for him. Uh, I'd be the only one that would listen, lay, awake, lay awake at night and listen for him get up during the night because it was a, a grease can, a five gallon grease can at his bed and that, he's, that he's upchucked on many, many nights and cut his head. He's had a permanent scar there. I'd lay awake and listen for him to get up to help him be sick. I knew about that a drunkenness. I knew about a sorry SOB. And it was never called the disease of alcoholism. It was called cheap and trashy and dirty. And my mother had never had a drink in her life. And so that sort of added to all this, you know, and we wouldn't have a drink in the house. And so I already felt bad enough about myself and my behavior. And then to see when they said alcoholic where I might become. Talk about a fear factor. I had lived with fear all my life. That night, I came in to a meeting. The next, Dorothy brought me to the meeting the next night. And because of my home situation, she suggested I go to three meetings a week because we didn't have meetings every night then. And that was Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And when she left there, I knew that I would be at that meeting the next night. And she picked me up. And that was the last time anybody ever picked me up because I needed to be picked up for an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Because her opinion was, and and I agreed with her today, is that I will take you, I will introduce you. If this is for you, then you will suit up and you will show up. And from that day forward, I started my journey of Alcoholics Anonymous. And oh God, it was like a pink cloud. I loved everything about it. That pill problem I talked about, there was a little bit of a no-no in that. And uh, <laughs> uh, one of the ladies took it upon herself, and this was a truly a God deal. She took it upon herself to talk to me after the meeting, and she said, I had a pill problem too. And she said, I had to flush them down the commode. I was scared to death of those pills. Not that I was scared of the pills, but I was scared that I would take the pills because they didn't smell. And I knew that if I drank, you would smell it and you wouldn't let me come back. And I was so frightened that you wouldn't let me come back. Because when I walked in that room of that first meeting, it was the laughter. It was on April the 29th, 1971, and it was the laughter. And it was the love, and it was the hugs, and it was the care, and it was the understanding. Those are things I heard and I felt. And the one great, great gift I got that night, it was as though, I know today it was God, but it was though I had a crack on the back of my neck open up just a very, very little bit. And there was just a little tiny ray there. And I know today that that was my ray of hope. I know today that that was that my ray of hope that started in on my heart, that it was locked in so many layers of brick and mortar. Brick and mortar is how I had built a wall around me. And my heart was just frozen. And that's what I need to talk about is how I felt because my feelings were so much worse than some of my actions because I drank at home. I did a few things, you know. I like danced on the tabletop. I love what they have over here in the, uh, audit in the cafeteria. It says, please don't dance on the tabletops. And I thought, I could have used that about 35 years ago. <laughs> you know, I've danced on the tabletops. And, and uh, 
uh, you know, uh, I have drank to act naughty. Um, <laughs> and I used to think that I had to drink in order to act naughty. And that was the excuse today, I know, because I'd keep hearing my mother's voice come about and, you know, all these things that dancing's not good for you and it's going to lead to the stuff. And, you know, she was right and it did. <laughs> Ooh, and, uh, but I didn't have to do any of that sober, you know. I didn't have to do that sober so I could blame it on somebody. Uh, I am so grateful when I got here that you started teaching me how to be responsible. You know, you didn't start out and just say, here's a book and come to a meeting. You took me by the hand and you said, come sit with me. And you know, I was such an introvert when I got here. And I was so shy that I literally clutched my fist and gritted my teeth and I walked with my head held down to get through the doors. And you know, like people are so friendly and they all have little groups. You know, I didn't have a little group and so I would just stand as close to someone as I knew and just sort of eavesdrop to hear what they were saying because it was always full of love and it was always full of laughter and it was always full of something positive. And you know, I said to God, I started bargaining to God just like I did when I was drunk. If you'll get me out of this, I won't ever do it again. But I started asking, I said, God, if you ever let me get comfortable and be a part of, I'll never let another person walk in the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous that's not greeted and loved and said, come sit with me. Because that was the one more time, just another part of how lonely and afraid and how inferior I was. Um, and I haven't. That's been a great gift to me. That's one of the greatest gifts God has given me is to allow me to be at the door and to welcome you and to say, we're so glad you're here. And you think I do that for you, but I want you to know I do that for me. I do that for me because I remember how it was. After I was in the program uh, for about a year, not quite a year, uh, my sponsor had told me not to make any major decisions for the first year. Well, I knew at that, I, I had known for four years that we had another lady involved in our life. And I didn't call her a lady at that particular time. <laughs> and uh, she knew I knew and he knew I knew, but we all three didn't know it together, you know. <laughs> and so we discussed, you know, we had some discussions about that. And so um, I started asking God, because someone told me to, uh, I went, in fact, I went to a, a conference and I heard someone say, when you're ready to hear the truth, ask God to give you the truth, to show you the truth, but never ask that without, God, please give me the strength to face the truth, to hear the truth, and to bear the truth. And I started asking God to do that in my life, in every area of my life. And, you know, I started seeing who I really was. I started seeing that I was a child of God, that I did have worth and I did have value. I started learning about those things through working the steps. I started learning about those things because you put me to work. You put me to washing coffee cups then. We had coffee cups, ashtrays, cleaning the bathrooms. It didn't make any difference that I had a maid at home, but I came down to the club and cleaned the bathroom. You know, and I still do that. And I love, I love being of service. Someone's gotta do it, why not me? You know, I love being of service because if I see that it needs to be done, then I'm the one that needs to do it. Uh, the one, the thing that, that really comes to my mind is I did this, what I'm fixing to tell you is I did dry. You know, I was nearly nine months sober and I left the house one day and um, I needed to call back home because we had a deal going about a car and I'd heard something, a, a good deal about a car and so I called his, told him what I'd heard and he wasn't there. And I knew exactly where he was. So I leave the meeting, I get, go, get in my car and I drive home and I get my gun. <laughs> Can't you see that? <laughs> and I go in and I get my gun and I know how to use it because I came from a farm. And I go down, and I used to love to describe where she lived and how she lived, but that's really not important. <laughs> uh, 
So I go in the back door, you know, and uh, I wave this gun around. And all the time I'm driving down there, I ask God, I said, God, if there is a God, please help me. Please help me. Because at that moment, that pain was so great. The shame was so great. One more time, I was not good enough. One more time. And that pain, I prayed all the way down there. When I got down, went in the back door and waved the gun around. You know, I had my say. <laughs> I was sober. I was dry, thank God. No, I'd probably use the gun if I'd been drunk. And um, I left. I went back home. I took the gun back home and put it in the gun case and went back to my meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> Insane insanity. Finished the meeting out, you know. Well, the word sort of spread. <laughs> my sponsor wasn't there that night. <laughs> she got to me very early the next morning. Uh, she suggested that we might start making moving plans before years up and so that's what I started doing and uh, I started making arrangements to move that I did not have to live in that manner any longer and that there was uh, that I could do it with God's help I found a little dinky dinky apartment I left a house with a swimming pool in the backyard a Cadillac in the driveway and I went to this dinky little apartment and that had pigeons, pigeons living out in the back courtyard. And uh, I put some draperies up, I cleaned it really good, painted the fence green, and cleaned all the pigeon stuff out of there, planted some little flowers, and that's where I started the path of my life in Alcoholics Anonymous, in my sober life, and my good life of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was not a life of lies. It was not a life of deceit. It was a life of hope. And about this time, I have to tell you about Frank. And Frank was my husband for 30 years. But Frank came into AA seven, uh, about six weeks after I did. And at the first year of his sobriety, his wife had asked him for a divorce. She didn't like him drunk and didn't like him sober, supposedly. And his sister had passed away, and he had a really rough time. And in, in home groups and little groups, you know, that's just that's what you do, is that you share your experience, strength, and hope. And I had been living alone for quite some time, and Frank started calling and asking me would I like to go out and eat before we would go to a meeting, because we were still going to the same meetings. And uh, I said, sure. You know, so we went out, we started out to eat, and we were never going to get married. And, and we didn't for two years. We dated for about two years, and uh, we got married in 74. And I want you to know that that began one of the most awesome rides of my life. Uh, we, had, we were both sober. We both loved. Our first love was the program of Alcoholics Numbers. That was the first in our lives. And we had come from some really, really bad situations and we were, we were in, a way, in a new way of life, in a life of hope. And you know, I had a lot of admiration and respect for, for, for him. He was funny, uh, he was entertaining, he was probably the kindest person I had ever known, not just to me, but to everybody. He just had a heart so big, it was just awesome. Uh, thank God we had Oh, two years, he had over, he had nearly three years sobriety, I had two. Thank God we had that much time in the program or we'd have never made it because we didn't know how to live sober. We didn't know how to live with someone. And about not long after that, uh, women's conferences came along and I started going to woman to woman. And about that time, my sponsor died and I got Octavia into my life. And uh, let me tell you, she'll straighten you out. <laughs> Uh, but we, we started what I know today was a, a path, a life of a soulmate. 
uh, it wasn't just Frank or just Nelda, it was Frank and Nelda. That's who and what we became. But we were all so very, very much apart from because so many people that, that know me here didn't know Frank because this was a conference that I loved before we ever started dating. It was part of me. And Frank likes to rough it in the Hilton with room, room, slow room service, so, you know, this didn't appeal to him. But, you know, he always was assured that I had my car filled up, I had new tires, and I had a good car and sent me on my way. And so I have done that all these many years. It has been wonderful, and this was the hardest year coming because I didn't have all that. You know, this was the hardest year for me to get ready to be here because I didn't have my little ritual of sitting on the sofa and doing the name tags or telling him everybody, oh, so-and-so's coming. And remember, I told you that he married so-and-so. You know, just bringing him up to date on my family, my Brownwood family. But, you know, he's here in spirit. He is here in spirit. Little girls started asking me, precious, lovely little ladies started asking me to sponsor them. And I thought, you want me to tell you how to live your life? <laughs> well, I learned it pretty good because I ordered them around to good now. <laughs> uh, and it's been a journey. Sponsorship has been a journey for me. Uh, but I had a good teacher. I've had several good teachers. I was not sponsored ever harshly. I was never diminished, which I think is so very, very important because for the first 33 years of my life, I was diminished probably every day, or I accepted that. And you taught me in here that I don't ever have to live in a situation or be in a situation like that again, is that I'm a child of God, and I also need to know that you're a child of God, and I need to respect you with dignity. I need to treat you as if God was in the room. And you know, I heard so much of that from my sponsor, and I saw how she and Johnny lived, is that I wanted my marriage to be that way. You know, I went to marriage uh, to become a marriage counselor because I was so interested in, uh, the, in the good welfare of good marriages. And you know, I, even though I took the series, <coughs> I, I, that's something I didn't really want to do after I took it, but I wanted the knowledge. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to listen to other people's problems, but I wanted the knowledge. I wanted to know the know-hows. I wanted to know how to be a good wife. I wanted to know how to be a good partner. I wanted to know how to be a good helpmate and not be a doormat and not get in their face and you know, uh, get to the point of where they push you or shove you. I didn't want anger in that. I wanted to treat him with as much respect and dignity as I treated you. I had a mentor that's not in the program that her husband was AA, but she talked about why would you treat your mate differently than you would someone at the grocery store the postman, a total stranger. And you know, that was the basis and the foundation that I heard in this program, is how do we treat other people? That's what's so important. But before I could learn how to treat you, I had to learn really who I was. And I had to learn about the steps, and I had to work the steps to the point in the way we worked. And when I first got here was every Wednesday night, I was at a step study meeting every Wednesday night. And every time I talk to my sponsor about one of my problems, she'd say, well, now, honey, what step is that? And da-da-da, what is an antidote? And so that's the way I learned about the steps. And I think it's wonderful, all the step studies that we have going today. Uh, I think it's wonderful, the educational part that we've got going in the program, Alcoholics Anonymous, today. But we didn't have that when I came in. You know, we were just sort of uh, grasping along in some of it. And you know, we come in rooms like this and we see a lot of women. There wasn't that many women active when I got sober. And I am so very, very grateful to those that were here, but also am I very grateful to how kind and wonderful the men were to me. You know, I never had a problem in that area uh, because I was surrounded with women that were working their program and they protected me. And I think that's so very important. They protected me from myself and they probably protected the men from me. But, you know, because sick gets sick together. And I think it's real, real important that I remember that. I think it's real important that we all remember that. That's not who we are today. Who we are today, if you're here and you're a lady and you walked in those doors and you have one day sobriety, you have a choice of how you walk out of here. You have a choice if you continue to be a lady or not. You have a choice if you continue to walk with dignity and grace. I learned that 
through sponsorship. I learned that through getting to know a God of my understanding through my sponsor. I learned that through fellowships just like this through other women, the experiences of the women that came before me. And I'm so very, very grateful for that. An attitude of gratitude was one of Joe Clary's sayings, and he was very instrumental in this uh, conference, is an attitude of gratitude, an attitude of gratitude. And you know, some days I have to get out of bed, literally, and write down what I am supposed to be grateful for, what I should be grateful for, because sometimes my mind just is not very grateful. And you know, I find that when I do that, and I turn the light on, switch works, the electricity's paid. That's a, sometimes the smallest beginning I can ha get into contact with God, the God of my understanding. And then it got where it was a little easier to get with God of my understanding. And then I never shall forget the very, very first time that I felt the oneness with God and that there really, really was a God. I was still in my marriage. We had five o'clock bar open every day. This was July the 4th and there were a lot of people around the pool. And so I was going to go in and fix everyone a drink. And you know, it was hot in Midland, Texas, and I was with a bunch of drunks, and I'd had it about up to here. And so I thought, they're all drinking, no one will smell me, and I don't have to go to a meeting for two nights. No one can smell me. And you know, as I walked around the, in the garden room, the den, to the bar, the phone rang was my sponsor that never, ever called me at that particular time. And she called and said, oh, honey, just wanted to wish you a happy 4th of July and hoping you're having a good day. A God deal. What a God deal that is in my life. And you know, I went over and I fixed those drinks and I walked out. And I just said, thank you, God. Thank you, God. I've had little God deals like that all along. You know. It's those God deals that I keep coming back to hear. It's those God deals that mean so much to me, not only mine, but yours, because each time that you come in and you share your experience, strength, and hope, the God of your understanding, it gives me one more day. And you know, our steps tell us about to be of maximum service to God and our fellow man. And it, talks about, it also talks about to continue to help those uh, that are still suffering, how many people are sitting in this room that is suffering from one thing today? We have a lot of people here that are suffering today. And we're here filling these chairs up, being here for them and loving them. Just as you were for me 34 years ago, 33 years ago. And just as you were for me seven months ago. You were in these chairs, sitting in these chairs, doing what you were supposed to do for you and being here for me. You know, I have a lot of friends on the outside that I work with and they say, Nelda, I can't believe that you still have to go to those meetings after all these years. I said, oh honey, I don't have to go to any of them. I get to go to them. You know, I owe, and I'm not anonymous anywhere I am. I have to go in order and I get to go in order to be there if there is a Nelda that walks in that door that was as sick and sad and as sordid and the loser that I was because I'll never ever repay my debt to Alcoholics Anonymous to the people, the fellowship in these rooms, my sponsor. I will never repay that debt of the last 33 years that I've had. I will never pay it. I can't live long enough. I have to be there doing, cleaning the commodes. I have to be there making the coffee. I have to be there hugging someone. I have to sit in a chair. I have to chair a meeting. I have to be there regardless of how I feel. And that's in my schedule. Uh, with Frank, I got three kids. And of course, they were grown when I got them. Uh, but let me tell you about my grandkids. They came along. Uh, they're 13 and 7 now. They were, our, our family partied a lot and you know had good times. And they didn't start having babies until we were older. But we loved, Frank and I, Frank was 72 when we got our grandbabies, and immediately we just, you know, shifted gears. But the kids grew up knowing that Mimi and Granddad, on Mondays and Thursday nights, was at committed meetings, and the first Saturday of each month, we did our birthdays. And then in between, whatever. But those were things that we were never available for them. And they understand that. You know, that's just part of what we do. And you know, it is so awesome 
when you walk in those rooms and know that those children are your gifts because you're sober today. Those children we would not have had. Those grandchildren we would not have had if we had not been sober today. And you know, you've heard so much about the step parents and whatnot. And you know, I was never a stepmother. I was, a, I was, I was married to their dad. And we, there were still family issues, but thank God the program of Alcoholics Anonymous came about. And we could be united. And we could be united with the children's mother. And thank God for that. You know, it is so awesome what this program has done in my life, just in my everyday living, is that we can go to the baseball games together. We can go to dance recitals together. You know, I can invite Frank's ex-wife to my house for dinner because it would, have, it would benefit his children. And I'm so grateful that you gave me that. You gave me that gift. You know, I want to, to tell you just a little bit about my last several years. I don't want to rush over anything about the experience, strength, and hope, because the experience, I got drunk, you know, I act naughty, and I'm here. The, <laughs> the strength was, I, the strength was Al-Anon found me and gave me to, to the AA's women. And thank God for that. And the fellowship and the God that you have given me. And the, it's a new path, a new way of life. You gave me all of that. And I, I, I really do want to give that the right amount of time and energy. But where my heart really lies today is where I am. And where I am is a heck of a place. Um, my husband was diagnosed with uh, lung cancer five years ago. And, uh, you know, we got it all. And we were going to beat this deal and for one year we did the treatments and and he was a trooper and we did wonderful it came back and when I got home from Brownwood last year thank God I had Brownwood last year we got the results that had reoccurred and so we started the treatments again and it was supposed to last through this summer well it didn't it lasted through January the 17th and my Frank died uh, but he died with dignity he died with dignity because he had you and I was there because I had you. Uh, there were 1,400 people at his service because of Alcoholics Anonymous and who he had become through that in the last 34 years because of the program. You had given us that. The walk that you had allowed us to take and the respectability that you had given us. Alcoholics Anonymous one more time had given that to us. His family was there, and they were proud of us. They were proud of the life that we had led because of you. What a gift. What a gift. You know, and he died with dignity. And I walked through that all with dignity and grace. And now I'm falling apart. But where am I? I'm at a meeting saying, what am I doing here? How did I get here? I have not missed a meeting. I've added more meetings. I've started the 90 meetings in 90 days because I needed more meetings. I go to several groups now because we don't have that many at the little house group that I go to. I go to Serenity and I have a place there at three of their meetings. I go to Alpha Omega on Saturday morning. I have a place there. And you know, these are all meetings that is wonderful in our town. I just didn't have the need for them before. But somebody was sitting in those chairs being there when I and many like me walked in and had an extra need for meetings. You know, if I have given one ounce of love to anybody, I have received a million times back because this is a journey that I have not had to walk alone. People that I didn't even know that was, that I didn't know except to hello and how are you and hug you, it seemed as though they were, out of, they were there. Everybody was there for me and still are for me. They let me be who I am. They encourage me to feel the feelings. They encourage me to do the deal. You know, I've done some other things, and the, the big book talks about if we need outside help. I have needed outside help. I've gone to grief recovery. And you know, they tell it just like we tell it because they, they put labels on your feelings, like if you think you're going crazy or if you, you know, uh, maybe don't want to get out of bed that day. They'll, they say, we understand. They use those words. So you gave me that gift in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous to go to outside for help. Every area of my life is Alcoholics Anonymous. 
every area of my life, I am blessed. I am truly blessed today. I am blessed because of sin and men and gin. <laughs> if I hadn't have done all those naughty things, I'd have probably ended up in the First Baptist Church and never got here, you know? <laughs> and those that I know in First Baptist Church are wonderful people, but God, you know, they don't have this love. How many do you know that could get up and tell you what I've told you in the First Baptist Church? <laughs> and they still may want to say hello to you later. You know, and I, my little granddaughters, my, my grandchildren are First Baptist Church, and so I'm there a lot too, and I'm, that's making light, that's making sport. Uh, it's an honor. It's an honor. And thank you. Thank you for what you've given me, and thank you for the trust that you put in you've given me about letting you really know who I am. Uh, someone came up to me today and said, Nelda, I've known you forever now. I'm going to really get to know you. <laughs> well, we'll see later if you really want to get to know me. <laughs> Thank you, and I love you. followed her around for these 15 and a half years. Nelda, thank you so, so much. Come get your gift. Thank you, buddy. I hope y'all forget everything I told you. <laughs> we won't, will we?